good afternoon for most of you and good morning on the west coast and welcome to c4's october uh, november power hour which is centered on developing a roadmap to racial equity in behavior health and recovery organizations before we get started please introduce yourself in the chat box i see some of you have already done that uh, we really want to let everyone know you know who's here where who are you where you're from we're hoping you'll really use this chat box to to talk to each other and just ask questions um it's it's just so much better to have power hour when we have lots of people contributing and asking questions and weighing in so we want to feel the power from everyone so please 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 be ready be interactive this is going to be a great session and i just want to introduce myself my name is livia davis i am the chief learning officer at c4 innovations and one of the members of the c4 organizational development team and i'm going to be moderating today's discussion so next slide please at c4 innovations or c4 that's you know we have shorthand for our, our company c4 so you'll hear that throughout today we really work with to advance recovery wellness and housing stability for people who are marginalized and we really are also very committed to reducing disparities and achieving equitable outcomes we do this in many many different ways and one of the ways we're doing it is by partnering with people with lived experience that's a very important foundation for all the work we do we also partner with service organizations and communities and systems in order to figure out how do you develop and, and, and implement all the best research-based solutions that are person-centered, recovery-oriented, and trauma-informed. So we hope that you will take the time to learn more about C4 by visiting our website. And you can see it's there, c4innovates.com, or you can go to our Facebook or Twitter handles and we also have a YouTube channel. So C4 is a woman-owned small business. We are so happy you're here. I'm so glad to see where you're calling in from and joining from. We're seeing folks from um, already from, uh, oh, right here in Massachusetts. We're seeing people from Detroit, Michigan. This is wonderful. New York State. Yes, please, 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 please let us know where you're coming from and, and dialing in from. It's great to have you here. So, before we get started and turning it over to our amazing presenters today, and you're in for a treat, I'm going to turn it over to Bina St. Loth. She is our amazing tech support person, and she's going to provide a few tech trips. Bina? Hi, everyone. Thank you again for attending our event today. Um, and regarding this event, um, our audience will be in listen only mode and you all can submit questions by typing them into the chat box and in the Q&A. And if you're experiencing any form of technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat box. Um, again, like Livia said, we have tech support with us and we will be monitoring the chat box and can view your comments and respond to your needs. And you also have the option to email us at training at c4innovates.com. The style of today's event is depending on this type of participation from you. You will see a couple of polls popping up in today's room and presenters today will ask for some feedback from you and we hope that you are willing to participate. Um, as a reminder, we this event will last for about an hour, but you have the option to stay with us offline for 30 minutes where you can ask questions to the presenters directly and in terms of the chat box please direct your responses to all panelists and attendees um, and we'll provide some language on in the chat box and with that i will turn this over to livia to introduce our presenters thank you bina uh, before i turn it over to our subject matter experts i also just want to take a moment to thank you for those of you who uh, answer some of the questions during the registration process it's really helpful and we hope to touch on some of those a little bit later and of course, if you have questions that come up as you listen to our conversation, please either you know, write them in the chat box or jot down a note so that you can be ready to ask them as we get into the more interactive part of this um, power hour. I'm going to turn it over to Ariel Britt and Ashley Stewart. They're going to introduce themselves. 
Um, so please go to the next slide and I'm gonna start with you, Ashley. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Stewart, SC4. I am a training and curriculum specialist. Uh, my main body of research is looking at institutionalized forms of identity-based oppression. I consider myself a race equity scholar. I study, have studied, um, look the, the impacts of institutionalized forms of inequities and working in solidarity with mental health professionals to ensure that we are creating the most dynamic and inclusive spaces possible where people can thrive, be their most authentic selves, and most important importantly, be able to contribute fully and wholly uh, with the work that they're doing. So I'm really excited to, to have this conversation with y'all today, and I'll turn it over to Air. Hi, everyone. So excited y'all are here. My name is Ariel. Folks call me Air, and I'm a person in long-term recovery from a substance use disorder. And so for me, that means I haven't used alcohol or drugs in nine years. I just celebrated nine years, which is like Amazing, amazing, amazing. I can't imagine my life. The fact that I'm in these, this room, speaking with these amazing folks, sitting with all of you, it's truly, truly a gift. In a pandemic, you know, like, I'm just so, I'm, I'm just so grateful. I'm just so grateful. Um, yeah, so I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I'm currently working outside of this work as a subject matter expert. A lot of my work is centered around creating spaces for folks young folks, young adults in recovery. I really get excited about anything related to prevention, anything about making spaces more accessible, um, recovery capital, recovery support services, peer-driven services, and making sure that that door is open a lot wider for folks that look like me, folks that have different identities than the ones that are typically in the room. And so I'm excited to offer my personal experience and then a little bit of a little bit of heat for y'all today, as my friend Daryl McGraw would say, but we can keep going. <laughs> heat is good. We, we love the heat. So, you know, one of the, the things of uh, this work, we talk about this work is that, you know, discomfort is a core competency. So uh, we, we like to bring a little heat. Um, Ashley, I'm going to turn it back over to you to get us started. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I read we can go on uh, to the next slide and I'll just let you know when to advance. Right. So I want to start us off by starting with rethinking our framing. We want to get into this conversation thinking about race equity in, um, in, in different spaces as it relates to sustainable change, which means that there's something that has to give, that means that there's something that has to change, that means that there has to be some sort of reframing of the way that we look at it. So sticking with what we have on the screen right here, let's think seriously about change. A lot of times I find that our framework is that we're looking at diversity, bringing in a wealth of experience, knowledge, lived experiences, all types of identities, worldviews, realities coming into a space. And then we look at inclusion and we say, can everyone participate? Can everyone engage the same way? Do every, does everyone feel welcome? And then we establish that the combination of those two things or that we have those things established and then we mark into making the space more equitable. And that's typically how we look at it. Thinking of equity as fairness and, and everyone gets to participate. But the shift that we want to take is to realize that equity is not a, a title. It's not something that we can claim. It's a process, right? And so a lot of times folks will ask me, well, then, well, what is equity? And so when we're looking at diversity and inclusion, we really are capturing uh, what is at the forefront of what is expected or what should be present. But when we open the door to examine equity, like real equity, there is a whole mass of things that we must be able to consider. Considering equity means thinking about the lived traumas that folks bring to the recovery space. Thinking about equity is thinking about systems of criminalization and medical distrust. Um, thinking about equity is thinking about the intersectional identities, all of the things that many of us, depending on our positionality and our privilege, do not have to think about on a daily basis when we occupy space. So equity is more than just treating everyone equally. Equity is more than diversity. Equity is more than diversity and inclusion. It's about being really intentional and thoughtful about what that systemic structural change could look like so that when we get diverse folk into the space, they can be included. So I, I, you can hit the next, lot, uh, next button. I think that we should begin to look at and examine this a little differently. And that is we prioritize equity first. 
We say that we are going to commit to the process of changing, shifting, moving stuff around and bringing that heat right off the bat so that our space can be genuinely and authentically inclusive. And that way, our diversity initiatives are performative. Because if we put diversity first, inevitably, we will be performing trying to create or demonstrate or uh, illustrate this type of inclusion that doesn't actually exist or that we're trying to catch up behind. So by shifting our perspective, rethinking our framing, prioritizing equity, we really can have the difficult conversations that we need to be existing in, talking about what does, you know, culturally imperialist um, uh, engagement look like? When we're engaging with communities, are we starting out in a space that we have identified as the normal or a typical way to engage? Or are we assessing how that might be rooted in systemic or structural oppression? Are we considering, you know, the inherent institutional biases that might be present uh, when we're engaging with diverse communities? And so we're, we're going to have this conversation and we're going to start this conversation from a place of equity uh, and, and establish that that's an essential first step before we begin to think about how to be inclusive and how to um, diversify our spaces. So you can continue to click on through, just further reiterating the step of the different modes of this process, which go equity and then inclusion and then finally diversity. So, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Air, would you be uh, next with regards to looking at, you know, how you operationalize and how you thought about applying this framework in some of your work? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's always helpful to kind of paint a picture of what Ashley was really talking about. So I know I'm not the only person in recovery in this room. If you're in recovery and you're proud of that, please shout, shout yourself out. Um, be honored in this space right now. And um, for me, I grew up in a predominantly white environment. My mom always said the best schools, we're gonna put you in the best schools possible. It did not matter. It did not, did not four years this month, shout out to Laura. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it didn't matter. And so it mattered to her because she knew that that was a great way for me to build some social capital, right? But when I got to college, life hit a turn and my substance use disorder went it started, it began in such a deep way, it became a serious problem. And luckily for me, you know, after I got sober, I think five years after that uh, was a time for me to, to look back on my experience and say, oh, what was I doing before this? So you were in college, you can go back. So I had that recovery capital piece. And when I got there at the predominantly white institution that I went to, Michigan, that's why I shouted out whoever is from Michigan, from Detroit, um, that's where I'm from, born and raised. Um, it was such a blessing for me to uh, be at a university where they had just started up a collegiate recovery community. Now, around this time was when the opioid crisis had just really started to really take off. Um, probably about five to 10 years before that, there were some talks of collegiate recovery, but around this time, there was probably about 30 programs for recovery support services. And so, what I always consider, you know, if, if this didn't happen, if this wasn't the space that I was able to have a point of reentry, a point of rehabilitation, a space where I could thrive, what would I have done, right? And I'm so grateful for that. But what I noticed along my journey and in my career and how I've grown and, and all of that, I've noticed that at the detriment of these spaces, of me being allowed in these spaces, I'm oftentimes the only person of color in these rooms. And the more I, I grow in my career and now being a senior director at the organization that I primarily look, work at, I notice still again, I am not, I am an anomaly, right? And that's the reality because what I realized if I took, took the shades off, like Ashley was speaking out, a lot of these spaces, the reason why that they were created, they were created not with me and my experience in mind. Everybody has a story. You all have a story. We all have a story. We all have our own experiences. But what gets the backing of that? What gets funding? What gets supported? And I remember I was working at this one organization, phenomenal, you know, and all he wanted to do was to take people in recovery and offer them a space where they could work out. 
and have fun working out and get connected and go on excursions and biking and CrossFit and all these things. And he had this beautiful vision that he would find other communities and create communities for people like him, right? And so he was creating a community with him in mind, white, cisgender, male um, activities that are predominantly done in those, in those communities. And so there was, a, there was an outlier there, but it was all, it was, it, the difference was, right, I think it's really important is to be mindful and be held accountable from a top-down process about intention versus impact, right? A wonderful intention. No matter what we're doing, it's beautiful. We are trying to create spaces and organizations that support people in recovery. But oftentimes, because you don't have people in the room outside of your own experiences, we miss it. We miss that, that piece that Ashley was talking about. We miss equity first, right? We miss thinking about the visioning, about what activities would look differently for a person whose experience is a little bit different, you know, who comes from a severe line of trauma and um, detriment and injustice and, and inequality within their own experience. Can they afford housing? Can they afford all these things? Shouldn't they have the same access to some sort of recovery capital? Or are we just going to settle with some form of harm reduction? How are we looking at this holistically? And so that's what I really challenge and challenge folks to learn. And what I've learned in my journey too, you can still have me as a senior director, right? Me in a position of power and authority in your organization and still be rooted in really problematic practices. You can still have an all black board, all board of BIPOC folks and still be rooted in systems of oppression. And that's how cunning this is. That's how cunning this is. And so it takes a lot of diligent effort, a lot of calculated um, inventories, which Ashley will go into for us to really dismantle and see what are we really looking at? You know, who is missing from the room? And how do I not just tokenize them, but add value to their experience? How do I not just pull them in when I need them for this picture, when I need them for this story, for this image? And so that's like, that's really true. It's really honest. And so, um, the goal and what I really see too is that racial equity, any form of diversity, racial equity, it can't be something that is just as important as a program, right? It can't be an offshoot. It has to be embedded into all of that. If we see recovery and the substance use disorder and the pathway of recovery as a continuum of care, we know that oftentimes leaves folks in silo. That can happen within our organizations as well. It is our responsibility to do this work and try our best to embed that visioning piece, that higher perspective of intention versus impact in everything that we do. I mean, from the person that cleans the floor to the top person that you rarely even talk to who you're trying to get, get their permission to do something from. And so it's, it's not easy, but that's not why we're here, right? We just know that it's vital now. And so I'm just grateful for, for y'all being here. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, um, Olivia, go ahead. <laughs> there was just a, a question for you, Air, really quickly before maybe, Ashley, you can talk a little bit about the, uh, your, your point, your next point. Um, you know, there's a question from Anami Washington. They talk about, you know, in most instances, there's more, almost invariably a coexistent mental health issue involved with a chemical dependency. And that's not uncommon in a college situation. And um, it, could you talk about that just for a moment as it relates to this? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it even goes with what Ashley was saying is, is trauma is real. Co-occurring issues are real, real. I know that's been in my experience as well. The longer I stay sober, the longer I see there's still some monsters on the bus that I'm going to have to navigate through. And so doing our best and this is the tricky thing too when we think about funding when we think about our role in this recovery space right and and our limitations and being able to partner with social services or other spaces that are solely focused on that mental health piece how do we work together to offer that and i think the more that we create trauma-informed approaches to all of it to the way that we we look at racial equity the way that we look at programs for folks the more that widens up 
and the more that we can offer that in. And I know that's difficult to do. The more that we can create spaces for peer-to-peer -peer support services, right? Allow peers to come in and share their experiences, the better off we are. But there's just some, I know there's you all are up against a lot when you have policies and grants and specific language that must be used. And we've seen a lot of restrictions over the past four years alongside of that and the work that we do. And hopefully as we continue to be loud and do our best to add folks to this movement that are from different backgrounds that do have co-occurring disorders, that we honor process addictions, that we're not just talking, talking about the opioid crisis when we know alcohol is still the number one offender for everyone right? We know that stimulants are on the rise, the better we are able to have more, more collateral and more support from higher entities to say that this, this work matters and we can create more funding for that. So you're right on. It's just, we're up against a lot, but that's the way I truly see us seeing how we can move forward together and really changing the game on this. Yeah. Um, I'm going to hop on and, and kind of build on some of the things that Eric just said, and I also see some questions in the chat that are coming through about like, you know, we're all different. We all have these different experiences. How, how do we obtain equity when everyone's coming in with all of these unique experiences, right? And then also thinking about what does it, what does it mean for that dynamic to change? And so I think that is a place where we sit and we really begin to examine what is culturally imperialist about how we are currently functioning. And what I mean by that are what are the norms? What are what is our established ideas of what's good and bad? What is the what is the language that we're using that could be potentially barriers to how we're thinking about uh, people's recovery as well as people's lived experiences? And so if the way that things are being done, what it, when we're thinking about you know people's lived experiences, if they're deviating from your own norm, but the way that the system functions feels very comfortable to you, then that might be a quick examination to say that I'm benefiting from or I am comfortable within this particular space. And so in that, and in, in, in acknowledging the diversification, the very complex and nuance of equity within diverse spaces is to first honor the reality that the people that are showing up that are altering literally who they are at the core and foundation to be present. We are, there's a few quotes that I want to bring into the space that if, if an environment feels threatening, we tend to conform to achieve a sense of protection. And for those leaders who are willing to take this on, will benefit more from the innovative conversations that will come. Because what we know is that there are folks in our organizations who are um, adjusting and altering tone of their voice, their physical appearance, their stories. They're altering and changing their stories to feel protected. They're adjusting their body posturing to seem less threatening or to avoid harmful remarks by other people within the recovery space. And so when we are not cognizant of this huge disparity of how folks can even show up authentically, and how that is rooted deeply in trauma and energy depletion in addressing and responding to systemic and structural barriers all day, every day. And we really don't even have an appreciation for where to begin in the equity conversation, right? What we know is that being authentic per, per, includes, increases our productivity, right? It improves our performance and our success. It allows us to stop depleting and utilizing uh, energy, trying to censor or hide ourselves and allows us to focus more on the task at hand. But when we're talking about all of the diverse experiences, well, that is because we get to sit around a table and discuss and decide and uh, create ideas about how to and if and when to make spaces more equitable. So the reality of it is, is that folks are always going to have diverse experiences. But when we're looking at equity, whose voices are intentionally being left out, unintentionally being left out, whose experiences are marginalized and whose experiences don't naturally align with the way, like Air was saying, the structure was set up to run, to exist in general. And so really challenging those norms uh, and developing appreciation for how people have to show up and have been showing up in these spaces. I think we see this all the time, right, Ashley, mm -hmm. where you are working for an organization or Whatever the, whatever the event is, even if it's a, a group project in college, I remember this all the time. It's like, man, this person is not pulling their weight. They are problematic, but we're gonna just put this on our backs, right? Cause I gotta get that A, 
You know, I have to win at this thing. But at the detriment of allowing that energy or that problematic person to permeate the organization, whether they are above you or below you, really prevents us from trying to live a more principled understanding of what we want this to look like. And like I said in the chat, whatever you're creating and whatever you're visioning and, and the idea that you have within your organization, I guarantee you it's not going to work for everyone. I guarantee you. And that is not the point. The point is for us to be able to provide spaces for people to create what is real and allow people the option of joining you in that. To say, oh man, they came and they, they said, why don't you have this service? Why is this, why is this not accessible to me in this way and me in this identities? Did you question that? Did you question that with how you um, presented that programming or how you opened that door? Was it an option for them? Do they know about that? And then you can kind of decide how to move forward. And I think that's something that oftentimes I know for me, I have a big idea that I'm going to support and everything is going to look like everything, which negates my own intersectionalities. You know, there sometimes needs to be spaces just for certain folks and just for other folks too, right? But do they have the same capacity to create and be a part of this journey? Is that okay too? And we, we can go, I could go off on that for a really long time, but I won't because I think what will be nice now is to kind of hear Ashley talk about the work that she has done um, to help folks kind of understand. So if we were just saying like right now, what are some steps that y'all can do? How can you look and take an honest inventory of where there are some blind spots and biases in the work that you're doing? Ashley, what would you tell them? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Air. Uh, you know, it, it's a critical assessment of if the spaces in which we are doing things because we want to be, because we want to be equitable versus are we really putting in the effort, the time, and also the sacrifice of the action that comes with being equitable. So one of the things that I like to do when I'm partnering or working with an organization is just to see what is the information that's being put out? What is the image that's being depicted, right? And a lot of times we'll have, um, We'll have our, our program descriptions, we'll have our photos that, that suggest a level of diversity. But when I began to look into the intricacies of folks' websites, pamphlets, programmings, policies that they advocate for, the language, the critical language that would suggest that the commitment to equity work is not there. Typically, what I'll see is that folks have it in a particular siloed lane. They have a section, a part, a piece that focuses on diversity, inclusion, and equity. They'll have a task group that focuses on equity initiatives. Well, is, but is that additive service being woven throughout the, in, in the entire organization? Are we saying we want to commit to diversity initiatives in our recovery behavioral health space? Or are we saying we're really wanting to dismantle systems of, of, of racism, of sexism, of classism, of ableism? Are we naming and talking about the structural issues that are barriers for folk? And if we are uncomfortable naming and talking about it, then our ability to attract people who need that type of additional layers of healing won't be there. As a, as a person who has been engaging in this work for a very long time, the terms about diversity and welcome space is just a term. It has to be the action behind it. Where is the commitment to naming what are the forms of oppression that your community, your constituents, the folks who you are serving are actually experiencing? Are you talking about the complex layers of violence that are being experienced by people? Are you willing to bring that into the conversation to demonstrate that commitment beyond what has been, you know, become more of a common courtesy is to include something about diversity? Photos of happy, diverse folk is not going to be what takes it to the next step, but it's going to be looking at your board, <laughs> looking at, um, you know, the makeup and the con construction, examining whether the people, the BIPOC folk, uh, the systemically and structurally marginalized folk who work in your agency and organization, do they feel supported? And is that culture one that is really supporting it? Because one of the things that is very evident is when it comes to community members or constituents who would be utilizing different services, there is a felt energy. 
And I like to use the example of microaggressions because we all feel quite comfortable talking about microaggressions. It's a term that I think folks are quite familiar with. But what I think is missed in the concept of microaggressions is that it's not a one-off discriminatory thing that folk hear. It's not accidental or unconsequential. And in fact, the way that we talk about it and define it nowadays would actually suggest that it is just like this unconscious something that happened maybe, you know, didn't really mean it. But the scholarship behind microaggression shows that it creates a deep wound. It is a message that has been compounding on communities, on individuals, the entirety of their lives. So what might be a simple um, pleasantry that you might be suggesting could be just could be an additional layer to that wound for the communities that you're intending to serve. And that healing is by naming, acknowledging. We cannot challenge what we cannot acknowledge. And so I think that a big first step in working with organizations is helping them acknowledge our, everyone's complicity in systems of oppression. And that has been quite, um, that has been quite impactful. Yes, and even going off that, I often I had a really tough conversation with my bosses once. Um, there was definitely some racial issues that were going on that I felt like I had to overcompensate for and manage the appearance of our organization. And I remember just finally breaking down and just crying in our like one-on-one, one-on-two meeting with the high-level folks and then just being like, what can we do? Like, we feel like we're failing you. And um, I just told them, I said, well, you got to do your work. You know, you got to do your own individual work. I can't turn off this skin, right? I walk into these spaces. This is the first thing you can see. Just like I can't turn off the fact that I, uh, I have a substance use disorder. You know what I mean? I cannot turn that off. I can't just work from eight to five and say I am this oh, I'm a person in long-term recovery and be able to get paid in the positions that I get paid in and then go home and drink, you know, go home and let my guard down and go about my life. I have to work on my recovery every day, sometimes many hours a day and remember who I am. And I think we can really look at that in just the terms that, in the ways that we're working with ourselves, right? What is some of my work that I still have to do? How can I bring that that humility, right? And that accountability as a person in leadership to the table to reflect back to my staff of color, right? My BIPOC folks and the folks that are on the race of diversity on the team. How can I mirror that and say, hey, I'm with you. I'm gonna mess up. I'm gonna make some mistakes, but challenge me. How do we open that door to trust within that relationship? Because I'm telling you, as a person that has been tokenized my entire career, as a person that is, I, I ride for 12 steps, that's how I got sober. As a person who's oftentimes the only person of color in the room, like we are tired. Like it is even further traumatizing to be in spaces with my brothers and sisters and still not feel seen and heard. And these are the people in my life that are supposed to, to get it in a way. And so that's just important that if this is something that I'm experiencing, it's valid, just like your experience is valid too. And so we get to continue to do the work on ourselves so that we can create those spaces. Because if I'm not working on myself, you know this, I'm not gonna have the vision or the understanding to say, oh, I'm in leadership. I literally don't have the answer to this. Why don't we ask some staff, why don't we ask some people in the community about what a great person to help guide us through this work inside of the community that can come in and support us on this. Because I don't want to put this on all of my staff, right? My staff of color to feel pressure to do this. Maybe this is an opportunity where we can invest some time and some resources into bringing in the right people mm -hmm. to make sure that, and can they have an input on what that looks like? Because mm -hmm. I've been through that too. Yeah. I always tell yeah. people to that point, you know, I am a race equity scholar who is a black woman, but every person of color, every BIPOC person does not want to fill or occupy that role. And so it's important to be mindful of that. Livia, before you transition us, I just want to make a few comments. You know, it's the intricacies in the language. I know that a, a big norm in the, in the community is talking about being clean, but that language could potentially trigger or evoke something very harmful for people who have been systemically marginalized and treated as if um, be, the, the, the 
opposite of, of clean being the idea of dirty or not being worthy, right? And so that language is so rooted and it will look differently culturally for different folk and how they have been experiencing life. I think that that's just one example. I also want to acknowledge that um, y'all might not see it, but we are seeing so much great feedback coming in through the panelists only view. I want to encourage folks that if you're intending to send it out to everyone, make sure that this is all panelists and all attendees. But if you are intending to send it to us um, privately as panelists, know that I won't ever read anyone's names, but I just want to acknowledge some of the really critical things that folks are sharing in the chat that you all can't see as attendees. So folks are talking about, you know, the critical importance of, um, going into space and, and being told, you know, that everyone's going to have this sense of unity, but to find out that there's all of these emotional and systemic barriers that people are bringing that make their, their process and their progression through recovery very unique and different. Uh, you also have folks uh, sharing in the room that that they feel, um, you know, as white men, I felt assumed that my coworkers felt part of the team. And it wasn't until those open dialogues and tough conversations started to happen that folks even realized. And so we have gaps that we don't even know that we have. We don't know what we don't know. But the vulnerability about creating an inclusive space, an equitable space, means going that extra step to acknowledge that inevitably, as a protective mechanism, people are not going to show up or cannot show up out of fear of repercussion as their authentic self. And so we must create that space. Um, and so I think it can be a common goal that people can feel included if we honor that first and foremost to say that we don't need to have this all one size fit all kind of organization. Instead, we can have a place that honors what people show up in the space and that addresses tangibly the barriers that some of our folk are experiencing that others of us have not even had to conceptualize in our, in our lives. Sorry, Olivia, just wanted to no, are you kidding? Please, no, don't don't be sorry. And I and I think one of the things I'll just share as as a white leader um, is you know if you're willing to be vulnerable as a leader, which can be hard, right? Because you're supposed to to know everything, right? You're supposed to have all the answers and be confident. And there's a lot of kind of even white you know privilege for some of us white leaders in that, right? And so it's hard to be vulnerable. And so. I certainly remember a time when uh, I was thinking, hmm, well, if I get uh, some diversity on my board or on my team, then I'm not racist, right? And so if you're in that space, it doesn't mean that you're not trying to do better. It's just, you know, again, you're, you're, you don't know what you don't know, like Ashley is saying. And it's really important to be willing to do the internal work, as Ashley and Air point out, and not just say, Oh, tell me this, the, 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 the bullet point, what's the roadmap to get there? What do I need to change on my website? Or what policies do I need to audit? If, if, you, if you just do that and not do the internal work and say, what is it that I'm putting on a projecting outward in my work as a leader, then you're, then you're falling short. And, but that requires vulnerability. And, and I just want to acknowledge that. I mean, I've certainly fallen in the trap in the past to say, oh, well, I have a person on, on color on my team. I'm gonna ask so-and-so to educate all us white team members in a way that's comfortable for all us white team members. Um, and they must also be a racial equity expert, of course, uh, and they could speak for their whole population, for the, you know, everybody that they represent. And it's just not the case. And being vulnerable and be able to share that and then doing the internal work is just so important. So um, just wanted to invite some of uh, fellow white leaders if they feel they are able to be vulnerable, because that's a first step is really to part of the acknowledge that, what, what we don't know. So, okay, um, can we do a poll as we transition? That would be wonderful. We're gonna see a poll and you can see right here just um, how much time do you spend on your internal work? What well, we just talked about. How do you? How often do you reflect? Uh, how do you? You know, what, how do you? Do you read? Do you? What do you do to kind of look at addressing racial equity or you know, how you think about this diversity? We'll just give it another couple of seconds. 
Thank you for your honesty, everyone. Yeah, and I want to acknowledge why folks are responding. I see that we have a few more folks, and I want to, yeah, thank you for your honesty as you respond. I want to acknowledge that what folks are sharing in the chat, some of it's coming again to panelists, some to all participants, but folks are acknowledging that when you begin this process, you begin um, engaging in equity work. I've been using this like rug analogy, right? Uh, people are like, we're gonna start to, we're just gonna start to clean, we're gonna start to begin to address these issues. And then they uncover and realize the extensiveness to all the things that need to be considered. Once we begin to engage in equity work, like y'all are talking about here, you begin to see or, or, or read or listen to other narratives, extend um, your own reality to, to begin to conceptualize what other folks are going through. You begin to realize there's so many gaps that there's so much more to learn, that this is an ongoing, ever evolving process. And sometimes I can feel really overwhelming. You're like, okay, I just need a bigger rug to cover this mess up, right? But one of the things is that when that discomfort creeps in, when that realization that the issue is more enormous than you ever knew creeps in, that is the moment when we know that we are making progress. When the conflict starts to arise within your organization, when people begin to show emotion, when there's frustration that's being acknowledged and conversations are being put on the table. When people are asking critical questions, sometimes we might want to stifle that, um, that conflict, but there is, there is liberation and, and healing that comes through that space to acknowledge, to be present, and to just hold that. And so I want to, I want to just honor folks who are going through that process, even if that's for yourself internally, where things are beginning to unravel, to know that that is the good, that is the hard work that we need to be doing to move toward equity. Thank you. And you can close the poll, but I just, again, I want to echo, I just thank you for your honesty. I, um, it was a time period in my life where I was definitely kind of going, I just, could somebody just tell me what I need to know and, and not again, doing that internal work. Um, and it's just such a critical part of this. So thank you for your honesty. Okay. Um, you know, the other thing I thought was well, that was pretty uh, interesting that you mentioned, I think, Ashley, you said, when can we stop this work? And um, in a way, if I think about that question for just one moment, it means it's something I can check off or I can say, we did this as an organization. Why it's also uh, important, you know, an air and Ashley, either one of you to kind of uh, continue this work. Can you just maybe say a little bit more about that yeah for sure. i saw you unmuted so i'm happy to no you go ahead ash the way in which these issues and inequality inequities have evolved is the same way that equity is going to continue to evolve. Like I said earlier, being anti, there's a lot of talk about being anti-racist right now, about race equity. And, you know, to acknowledge some of um, the scholarships and some of my colleagues doing great work at Columbia, you know, there, it's not a, it's not a batch. <laughs> you don't get to say, I am race, I am uh, anti-racist. It is a process. It is a journey. It is a commitment. Understanding that the ways in which people are oppressed continues to evolve our knowledge in engagement with um, anti-oppressive work must also continue to evolve. And while now that I put that like term, I probably used it a few times, but into the space, I just also want to acknowledge that when we're talking about anti-oppression and uh, the ways that we contribute to oppression, it doesn't mean that we are saying we are menacingly oppressors. It means that we are contributing and part of and maybe sometimes complicit and in, inevitably in the multi-layered process that oppresses people. So there's inter and interpersonal oppression. This could be slights, individual comments, one-to-one -one interactions that you have with people that will continue to persist. So if we ever stop this work, that means we would stop evolving in how we have meaningful and connecting conversations with people, reducing our harm through microaggressive comments, or maybe that's even our own ideals or beliefs that we continue to push. Then you have, you have a social level, you have a um, and social and cultural and institutional forms of oppression. It's layered. And so there won't be a point when we say that we have it all together, but we will continuously be climbing the ladder to equity to, to you know, with the end goal of having um, equality for folks. Yeah, I think that's right on. And I always try to think about anything in my life that I want to maintain. When can I stop doing it? 
when can I stop being a good partner? When can I stop being a good daughter? When can I stop being in recovery, right? And what happens? When can I stop feeling good about the body that I'm in and not work out and just feel good all the time? Never, never. And I think that is just such an interesting way. And I, a lot of it, I, I, I blame on society for this like instant gratification, this one thing, oh, I'm gonna take the blue pills, this matrix thing, like this is just gonna be fixed by somebody else. And no, that's not what I know I'm here for anymore. I'm here to be embedded in the solution and be embedded in the work, be embedded in the grid of it, so that then I can hopefully create a better world for my, if I have them, I'm gonna just say my nephews, right? who are still at that beautiful phase of not understanding what's really going on, not understanding how the world is set up. You know, at what point do they not get to be little black boys anymore? That's terrifying. That is like, that hit my heart. Um, and so never, never. Um, no. one thing I will say, cause I thought this was a really phenomenal question and it brought me back. I saw it and I'm going to step in Livia. It was something related to how do we help folks of color not feel tokenized yes. in the work? I really like that question. And I know there's some large macro level systematic embedding situations, but something that I can just share, share from my own personal experience and the folks that I work with is the power of choice, right? The power of choice, the power to participate, as Ashley said. Not everyone wants to be the champion for racial equity in your community, in your work. And that doesn't have to be that responsibility. But they also don't want to have the choice of still feeling like their experience as a person of color doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think about this very tough time that we're in. We've seen this, Black Lives Matter, we've seen all these things really churning up as we're coming into this new cycle and this new journey. And one thing that I would have loved to have, even within my organization, is an opportunity of choice to show up today. Mm -hmm. Because they would know that as a person who has black little boy nephews, as a person that is a black woman in recovery, that my experience of watching what's going on in the world, there's a level of trauma that you will never understand. But somehow I still have to show up. So whether it's just a phone call and I see you, hey, I'm gonna send you a $5 Starbucks gift card just to have a little coffee like you are seeing there are some things that you you can just do so that this that the process of what's going on in my body and the trauma that's coming up for me is not ignored um, because I'm coming to you and I'm offering you more than just what I can provide you know through my work through my education I'm offering all of my experiences and just as you are so just honoring that and not feeling like I'm just here to fill a spot is really important. And there's ways that you can just really engage and build relationships with folks, you know, and get to know their personality and get to know what they're into so they don't just feel there. Thank you, Air. And I just want to honor that and your, your, what you shared about your, your nephews. Um, wow. Yeah, I also, there's another question in here and it has a lot of layers and I'm, you know, either one of you can, can answer this, but maybe Ashley, this might be a good one for you to start. Um, the question is around, uh, should leaders rely more on one-on-one -on -one dialogue in, in order not to outnumber quote unquote and discourage truthful, useful input? And yeah. there's a lot to that question. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you just have some thoughts. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do. I have lots of thoughts. So a, a big, the, so I like, well, someone also asked like, what role of capacity do we kind of facilitate some of these conversations? Well, one of the ways that we engage 
with whether that's an agency or whether that's individuals, is helping us understand our roles within our privilege and our subjugated identities. And one of the, the things that is critical to think about within our privilege and our subjugated identities is who we are creating comfort for. Who are we creating comfort for? And a lot of times when we're having the one-on-one -on -one conversations or maybe acknowledging that someone has caused harm in a particular way in a, a private or one-on-one -on -one space, we are also allowing the harm that has been caused to the broader community or for the individual who is experiencing marginalization to feel that in isolation. And so we are, I think one of the grounding principles that we like to establish is acknowledging that we hopefully, or this should be a goal of it, is that we want to reduce the amount of harm that we are causing to the folks that we are intending to serve. And if that is at the core of our values that we want to reduce harm, then can we come up with an agreement that I will let you know and you will let me know when we cause harm? And we have to acknowledge that part of that is being an individual is if someone says to me, hey, Ashley, I don't think you meant to harm someone when you said this, but I want you to think about how that could be considered. I have to take that information in and acknowledge that it's part of the communal goal to reduce harm to folk. And I have to sit with my own discomfort and recognize that it's not the role of everyone else to protect my comfort. And in, 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 in doing that, relinquish the safety of the other folk in the room. And so I think that there are absolutely times when one-on-one set-asides are, are helpful checking in to make sure that we're providing support, but the commitment to being anti-racist, uh, race equitable in an organization has to be something that involves everyone. And so we call out ourselves. We call out ourselves and say, you know what, we missed the mark here. We as individuals, I have been contributing to this form of harm to people. You have been causing harm to people and I'm going to hold us accountable to it because we share a common goal of, of beginning to actually be thoughtful and healing to the communities that we're serving. Um, you know, I, I, to the point too, I see um, someone in, in the chat, I'm trying to see if it was, it was to everyone, right? So someone shares that for right providers or counselors, um, understanding that you might not be the right person to hold space, but also understanding the ways that we have been trained in practicing, right? And, and that too, if as a mental health professional, one of the things that we know is that we help people address through CBT and MI, help them identify some of the non-useful or unproductive thoughts that folks can have. Someone comes to you and say, I feel anxious. I feel hypervigilant. I feel like people are watching me. I feel anxious. Well, for some of us, those might not be um, the most logical views, or we might be able to pinpoint where that's rooted and address it. But for some folks, that hypervigilance is rooted in reality. My neighbors might be watching me, right? Because I don't, I shouldn't be in this community. I do not belong. I might be followed around stores. In fact, that has happened to me before a lot frequently, often. So we want to be able to acknowledge that even in our practices of how we serve people, we have to begin to utilize this lens of digging up and uncovering um, how it might not be relatable um, and those norms might be developed around some folks' comfort and not all folks' comfort. That was much more than you asked me for, Olivia, but no, this is, there's so much here to, to learn from and to reflect on. Um, Air, do you have any, you know, kind of last words, either one of you, before we look at wrapping up and, and, you know, inviting folks to the informal part of the power hour? Sure. I, I would just like to, again, like the folks are saying, this is just, just a great space for us to have these conversations, and I don't, I would even say in a safe space, I wouldn't even say in a brave space, but I'm hoping it's, it feels like an empowered space. And this is just another beginning of the beginning. Um, and so I hope that if you don't feel seen and heard at this time and you have some follow-up questions, please drop in the chat. We'll try our best to answer them and send it out to the folks that registered. If you wanna stay on for the last half an hour, go ahead. But I'm just grateful to be at a point in my life and in my journey that's different from my ancestors, where you have two black women and feeling seen and heard and being able to talk about the implications of what happens when we don't do this work and have people in the chat hearing us and asking questions and wanting to learn more. 
we have come a long way, but we have so much longer to go, so much further to go. And so I'm just really honored and grateful to be able to be a part of this conversation and continue it in the future. Definitely connect with us. Thank you, Aaron and Ashley, so much. Um, if any of you would like to stay on, um, and Ashley and Aaron will be available for the next 30 minutes to an answer specific questions. And this is in the portion of the Power Hour that will not be recorded. Um, and so we just, you know, want to, we call it the green space just because, you know, if, you know, once you're at a, an opening like in Hollywood or somewhere, or you're on a Tonight Show and you want to meet the, the guest afterwards, you go into the green room, right? So this is the, the green room portion of our power hour and it's, it's not recorded and you can ask uh, direct questions uh, for both Aaron and Ashley. So before we close this formal portion of the power hour, um, I just wonder if we can get the slide up. Um, we want to make sure that you know that we also have tomorrow uh, a recovery live event, Seaforce Recovery Live event, um, which is at 2 p.m. Eastern. It's on recovery and re-entry. And you can see that there's a link to register on this slide at recoverylive at c4innovates.com. And if you go to the next slide, if you'd like to follow up and learn more about uh, some of the information related to today's discussion, or learn more about what other organizational development consulting services does C4 offer, you can reach us by writing us at training at innovates.com. You can also access the Power Hour recordings on C4's YouTube channel. I know there's a number of comments and questions in the chat box about the recordings being available. Yes, they will be available there will be uh, at that YouTube channel and you can see the link here. And uh, if you want to stay updated on any future trainings or opportunities or events, please email us at media at c4innovates.com and you can get uh, subscribed to a newsletter. And what we do a lot with our team, which is I'm so proud of being part of C4 uh, for this approach is that, you know, for any organizational development work, we really work um, with you to live your values, advance your missions, and we do that by crafting a customized strategy. And we really place a lot of emphasis on strategic planning and equity, talent management, nonprofit governance, and fundraising for organizational development. So we will customize it. Please reach out to us. Know we'll center equity in all that we do. And then please know also that today's recording will be uploaded shortly on the Power Hour Recordings and C4 um, YouTube channel. So um, the last slide before we go to our green room is uh, please join us next month for another Power Hour. And um, it is going to be on, let's see if we can get the last channel. Uh, oh, maybe we don't have it here, okay. So we will get that out to you uh, on next month at Power Hour. But please do, uh, if you want to, tune in for tomorrow's Recovery Live. And finally, we really would appreciate your feedback. So if you could complete the survey, that'll pop up on your screen as you exit. Uh, that would be just uh, very much appreciated because we want this to be helpful. We want it to be informative. We want to make sure that it's valuable. And we really appreciate honest feedback. Okay, so for those of you who would like to stay on for specific questions, please do. For the rest of you, thank you so much for attending, for your participation, for asking really good, hard questions. We hope you found it useful and stay safe until we see you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This has thank been great. You. Amazing.